Hi everyone. So thank you very much for joining. Joining. Um, and and welcome and to the merit education rounds. Um, I am Dr. Elif Bildrick, and I'm an education scientist in pediatrics and merit. Merit program is an education services program in the Faculty of Health Sciences, dedicated to advance health professions education scholarship with a vision to grow a community of scientists and clinicians to advance health professions education through research and applied science. Though today's education rounds is virtual, many of us in this event are connected by the land on which we work. So I take this time to recognize that McMaster University is on the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations, which was acknowledged in the dish with one spoon wampum belt. That wampum uses the symbolism of a dish to represent the territory and one spoon to represent that the people are to share the resources of the land and only take what they need. Now, before leaving the stage to our esteemed guest today, I will provide a very brief introduction. The title of today's education round is Walking Together, the importance of community, collaboration, and partnerships to further health equity. And we have Dr. Jerry Maniati as our speaker. Dr. Maniati is an associate professor and a clinician educator at the University of Ottawa and a researcher at the Berea Research Institute. Dr. Maniete founded the Equity in Health Systems Lab, which is an international transdisciplinary team focused on understanding and addressing inequities, racism, and injustice in health systems through collaborative partnerships using a scholarly lens. During the rounds, feel free to use the chat for comments and questions, as I will ask those during the Q&A period. But also during the Q&A period, you can ask questions by using the hand raising function as well. So without further ado, please go ahead, Dr. Maniet. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, uh, although virtually, uh, to be part of the Merit Rounds. Uh, I really do appreciate the organizers for inviting me uh, at this time and, and thank all of you uh, who are taking time out of your busy days uh, to, to listen in and to be part of this dialogue that we're going to engage in uh, this afternoon. But with regards to uh, my conflicts uh, of interest, I do want to flag that each of us comes with history biases, often unconscious, as well as beliefs and values that can result in conflict. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that we will take that opportunity today to work ourselves through that. Uh, and provide each other with grace as we do so. Because sometimes these topics, topics we'll try and explore today may cause cause a little bit of comfort. And so I want to make sure that we're that we're staged properly for that. But with regards to other conflicts, uh, you see, I've that uh, I'm the founding director of the Equity and Health Systems Lab, as well as the uh, EDIA cross cutting team lead for the Team of Under Care Care Project. Which I'll speak about a little bit, a little bit later in the presentation. So, in terms of uh, what we're talking about, often when we discuss areas of inequities, it can make people feel uncomfortable. But uh, one of the things I definitely don't want us to be going into is unsafe or uh, feeling like we're threatening uh, each other uh, with the dialogue. And so, there's a there's an important uh, balance that needs to be sought, that we're looking for uncomfortable, because that's what stretches us, that's what pushes us in terms of our thinking, but not being unsafe as we do so. The other piece that I, I wanted to identify was that we often talk about concepts of having safe space or brave space. I actually want to push us into something that's even a little bit further. Uh, the concept of creating accountable spaces where we move forward, where we're, we're not just promising safety or expecting bravery, but I think each of us takes accountability of trying to do a better job of creating inclusive and equitable spaces uh, in our communities, as well as our workplaces. This places the onus on us to take that role and take be more proactive uh, in, this, uh, in this type of conversation. And so slight shift, in, our, in the language that we use, but it unlocks a lot of other things that are really important as we, as we discuss these type of topics. 
So with that in mind, I wanted to show a video clip and have us think through the question, what is going on? And then after the video clip uh, is played, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a little bit of time for some dialogue. I'll put up a polling question just to engage you at, as we get our heads into, into our topic uh, this afternoon. So. just reflecting on sort of all of the guards being out there having to perform and then you know this one person's probably exhausted um sort of falls down every everything seems to continue on though like nothing really mm -hmm. changes in terms of the people that are performing except when the medics rush in but um yeah like just kind of everything's going on and this one person has just collapsed and yeah so that was one observation yeah and then Greg puts her extreme attention to duty. Uh, Lori, oh, it's great to see you, Lori. Uh, I love that. The show must go on. The show must go on. And, and context is really important. This is 30 degrees out. These, uh, these musicians are wearing woolen tunics and bearskin hats. Uh, and, and this is not surprise weather, right? Like it, they didn't just show up on the field and it became 30 degrees. <laughs> They knew this was happening and they permitted it to happen. Um, yeah. Lori, do you want to have any additional thoughts on, on your comment there? No, it was just that the, there was nothing. No one no one was responding like in the immediate context. They were coming from far away to try and respond. That's right. Even the even the the musician that was right beside the person that was on the ground basically said, point it, right? Like so they, they were aware what happened. They kept on task and pointed. And it, it was interesting, the person that was in the front, I, I guess it's the, 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 the leader of that section, didn't even turn around, uh, was, may have been blissfully unaware of what was happening uh, right immediately behind them. And uh, yeah, so lots of stress and exhaustion, could see them trying to keep going even after falling. Yeah, and and the guardsmen, yeah, expect this to happen in with that heat, and given the the instruments, all of these things that the, that they were playing, yeah. And Paula, uh, friend, is a principal euphonium player here. Uh, yes, someone who's played the euphonium would know this. This is this is tough work, and they're out there for hours with no water and all these things. So it's interesting, right? It was permitted to occur. It, 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 the show kept going on. And yet we can sit back and say, why? Like, why was this happening? What, what permitted this kind of culture to exist uh, that, uh, that the, the show had to keep going? And it's interesting. The, the second question that I wanted to pose was, is this something that we're actually seeing in the health system? Is, are these learning points that we can extrapolate and pull into where we are and where we situate ourselves. I'll be honest, I got an email uh, today and I'm actually kind of scared of going into work on Saturday when I start on clinical service because of the sheer volume of patients that are there and no clear plan. The show must keep going on, right? And, and, and this is almost, um, almost ridiculous, almost bordering, on uh, on on facilitating burnout and other elements, and yet we permit it. So yes, we can look at the military. Yes, we can look at these musicians and and analyze this brief video quite significantly. But yet, 
we often are not looking at our own context, our own systems, and realizing that there's a lot of problems uh, that need to be looked at, examined, explored, and addressed. And I think uh, this, this statement, many of you have heard this, what you permit, you promote, what you allow, you approve, what you don't condemn, you condone. And I think that's really important because as we go through our lives, as we go through our work, we're not blind to what is going on, but oftentimes we don't stand up. We're, we're okay to be bystanders, but we're not willing to stand up in this kind of space. So how do we actually address that? And with that in mind, I wanted to identify a couple of key background points and then look at a couple of key concepts before we look at how to create space for these type of important discussions and explorations to occur and how to do that as well with partnerships uh, in a way that may actually amplify or magnify the kind of work that you're trying to do. So 2020 for, for many of us is certainly something that's probably being ingrained uh, in terms of a year. Uh, for many, the pandemic uh, and the impacts of it have uh, burned into our minds. And uh, I don't know if uh, any of you have uh, children and had to also deal with the concept of homeschooling while also working. Uh, that's, uh, that's an additional trauma that many of us had to also go through and try and figure out. There was a lot of social upheaval because of this pandemic. But there was also the murder of George Floyd that occurred uh, in 2020. There was also the death of Joyce Ashaquan. In our own health system, with frankly, very racist uh, undertones and overtones to what happened. This was our system. This was happening on a daily basis. It just happened to be captured and broadcast. Tragedy. And so many health leaders, many in our institutions were trying to figure out what to do. There had been an awakening on so many levels of all the challenges that many of us have experienced and faced in the health system. These are not new things. These are frankly new to certain people and their perception and their awareness of this. And so many were asking, what do we do? How do we respond? And as we even move ahead, we're now in 2023, things are frankly, perhaps even worse as we consider all these other things that are now piling on to our space. This is making a very challenging situation even more difficult. And what we're finding is that there's a, there's clear undertones of elements that are at play. Power, privilege, oppression, these are very much entrenched, not just in our health system and our health profession systems, but also society. And what we're finding is in our context, in the health system, we're seeing fragmentation, we're seeing silos, silos that are up and, and, and further reinforced, all resulting in mistrust. This mistrust has consequences, has impacts, not only the care, but the experiences and definitely the outcomes as we see. So we're faced with options. What do we do? First, well, maybe we can just be a bystander and just accept the status quo, can't change it, a bit of apathy going on there, just tiredness of the whole thing. Or you can say, this has got to change. This has got to be different. So if we pursue the second option, because if it was the first option, this would be a very short talk. But the second option, if we're looking at changing this, how would we do this? How would we create and foster trust? How would we create a sense of belonging within our health system and our health professions education systems that are inextricably intertwining? present a couple of key concepts. And this allows us to leverage these concepts as we want to explore this kind of work. 
I think many of you have probably heard of the triple aim, maybe at least even the quadruple aim. How many of you have heard of the sextuple aim? This was actually just recently uh, published. And actually, I heard this when I was attending the conference in Halifax this past week. And so it takes the quadruple aim, it adds the concept of advancing health equity, which is really important. Let's park that there for a second, but it also includes the concept of environmental sustainability into improving healthcare. So I think there's going to be a lot of work, especially with that sixth edition of environmental sustainability and planetary health. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of work happening. But for today, I wanted to focus in on the health equity piece. But what is health equity? And most people have difficulty maybe even articulating this. And so I thought I would give a commonly held de definition. Well, it means addressing unfair and unjust conditions so that everyone can attain the highest level, pos uh, highest level of health possible. And as you see on this diagram, when you actually closely look at it, almost all of those things are social determinants of health, which are concepts that many of us probably heard early if you went through a health professions program in your first year. That's, these are not new concepts and new ideas. But what we're finding is that there's a close connection of these things. So that's health equity. Well, how does this actually transpire into our health system? And as I mentioned earlier, the concepts of trust and belonging. Well, if we look at this concept of creating that sense of belonging, what we often see in organizations is that we're on the left-hand side. Most of the times, we just don't wanna see ableism, harassment, sexual violence, and racism, and we'll call it a day, and we'll say that there's a policy in place, and we'll be content. But is that enough? Is that adequate to actually creating a sense of belonging? As you can see here, it's actually much further to the right. And the steps in between include creating a psychologically safe environment. What does that mean? Talk about that in a moment. Actively welcoming and engaging with others. How does that look like? And as you can see, it's on these two rails, continuum of inclusion and belonging, but also lifelong learning and humility. Bottom line, in order to create a sense of belonging, both within the small team that you might be part of or at the grander scale at the institution, it's going to take time and intentionality to make this actually happen. So what is psychological safety? Now, this is probably not out of a horror movie or anything like that, but perhaps for some of us, it may. It may bear some resemblance. And that's because for many who are uh, racialized, coming from minority communities, underrepresented communities within our health system, the health system is not a safe space. Even if you are a provider and, and professional or a learner in that space, not just if you're a patient. So when we look at the literature, uh, as we look at psychological safety, as it pertains to learners and, and those that are professionals in the system, we know that psychological safety is critical for actually facilitating improved performance. And especially when we're talking about team performance. There are four levels though. And as you can see, the four levels are listed here. Inclusion safety being the, the bottom level kind of level of safety. You know, you're here, you're valued, we'll treat everybody safely. But that's barely, you know, that's having a seat at the table, right? And as you can see, uh, there's a step forward when we talk about learner safety, even a further step when we talk about collaborator safety. I look at these two and I say, well, it's not just sitting at the table, but speaking at the table. But speaking at the table is different than speaking up at the table, which gets to the concept of challenger safety. And so these concepts have to be entrenched in the kind of work that we're thinking about when we're talking about health equities and addressing the inequities in the system. All of these things are required to create that sense of belonging. Time, intentionality, psychological safety, these have to be there. 
My colleague, Dr. Minka Chan from the University of Manitoba, she's a pediatrician uh, as well. She reminds me of this all the time. You need to be and feel welcomed in order to feel well and thrive. And that's a big problem in our current health system. We talk about burnout. We talk about not being resilient enough. I would posit that a lot of this is, is not related to the individual, but rather the system that they're within. How do you get a bad pickle? Well, they should be good cucumbers to start off with, but if they're put into the wrong type of brine, you're going to get a bad pickle. And that's, in essence, what we've done is we've taken really amazing, highly resilient individuals, highly qualified, amazingly accomplished individuals, placed them into a system and wondered why they were turning out to be bad pickles. We haven't interrogated and explored the impact of the culture, the environment, the learning and work environment that they are embedded within. So I'm going to pause there and just see if there are any quick questions or clarifications that I can provide before we start looking at doing research in this space. Elofia, are there any questions in the chat there? I don't see anything. Not yet, not that I can see, but everyone, you can see, you know, raise, use the raise hand, raise handing function to ask your question or write it in the chat. So we'll we'll keep an eye on the chat there, and uh, but I I do want to jump into, you know, we talked a little bit about those background items and key concepts. Well, how does that impact the type of research and scholarship that we can do? How do we actually make an impact in this kind of space? So with that in mind, I I wanted to pose this question to all of you. This is an amazing group of individuals, very well qualified in terms of researchers and thinking about theory and innovation. What do we need to consider when conducting research to address inequities in the health system? And if you want to put it in the chat, if you wanna come and turn on your microphone and, and raise a couple of points, that would be greatly appreciated. What do we need to consider? Anita, thank you. Who is doing the research and why? and ELF understand experiences. Do either of you want to maybe pull, pull a little bit more on those, those uh, concepts there? I'll let Anita speak first. <laughs> okay, yes. Anita, are you able to? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately and, and talking to colleagues about, but just the idea of this kind of health equity tourism where equity has become you know, of interest uh, lately. And so a lot of researchers um, have sort of flocked towards it, but without necessarily being critical about their own positionality and mm. perhaps their own motivations for doing this kind of work. Yeah, that's that's an important point. Uh, as someone who's been working in this space for almost seven years, yeah, there's a lot of people now, all of us are joining in, which is great, but you're right. Those interrogations of positionality and why am I doing this? Uh, it, it, we, we need to explore those things. Um, understand experiences. Elif, do you want to explore that a little bit? Yeah, or, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, as, as I was, I've been thinking about, you know, research and writing research proposals, something I actually, I've chatted with Anita about as well. Like, for example, the Tricastle agencies, you know, of course, um, for them, more sex gender related um, considerations, um, you know, beyond the, the other 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 things. But um, now I always thought of like, if we're going to include or consider um, including various aspects of um, understanding inequity or or these kind of things as a part of the research, like how do we do that? What is what is important for that research? Um, mm -hmm. Because we can't look at everything in one study, but trying mm -hmm. to prioritize and understand, um, understand you know, the literature um, in terms of what has been done so far, and 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 what are some things that that we need to look into within our own projects. Yeah, and I I think that's a very important aspect of it, and I'll touch upon it in a couple moments. 
Uh, but I also see some other comments here that uh, I also really appreciate. How, how, do, how can we conduct research in ways that don't replicate power imbalances? And this is often, especially when, when we explore research in the global health context, people go parachuting off to other places and do research. Well, the same thing happens within our own communities here. And uh, I've, I've really had really uh, eye-opening conversations with Indigenous leaders trying to understand what does it mean to have research conducted within Indigenous communities? Who owns the data? What's the sovereignty of that data? All of these key questions that we haven't actually asked or explored or found answers to, and people are diving in. They're, they're literally driving into communities and conducting things. So we have to be very careful. There, there are considerable harms and risks that can occur. Yeah, the diversity of the research team is, is also important. I like the comment there from Heather as well. <laughs> Sorry, uh, research priorities of the communities themselves. What are their needs? These are questions that take time to actually identify, right? You can't just sit in your office, think of a question and put it out there. Um, it requires time and relationship building. So some great comments here. I'm, I'm going to continue on because we're going to cover some of these points in the next few slides. Uh, as concepts that I really want to help uh, help us think that and realize that this type of research is different. It is different. It's different than our clinical and educational type of research because it's complex. It's messy. It's often different depending on where we go and which context we find ourselves. And so it often, this is one of those things that we hear you know, what kind of uh, study was it? Did we uh, isolate all the variables, especially for those who are really uh, passionate about quantitative research? Those are the things that they try and understand. But you can't really do that with this type of research because we're talking about relational experiences. Uh, we're talking about trust. We're talking about areas that are a bit more challenging, require different tools. The concept of exploring and co-designing with communities and content experts, I, I think this is often uh, um, uh, something that's missed as well. Or we're invited to a party very late. Uh, I've had people uh, with their beautiful grants, they come and say, oh, there's that question. Um, uh, we've got to actually get an EDI statement or you know, address the uh, SBGTA uh, category in the in the tri council stuff. Uh, let's go and talk to Jerry. The, the studies design, uh, they're ready to go, but they can't submit because they don't actually have content expertise, and nor have they perhaps even talked to the community. So it's fascinating. It it requires a very different approach to authentically ask good questions that actually matter to people. The other piece is that we're talking about cultural transformation. Um, and this is tough work. Uh, I don't know how many times I can show a person a pie graph or, or, uh, or a table that shows how significant the results are. People still won't change when it comes to what they think and how they act uh, in these kind of contexts. Let's, let's take a very simple example. We all know that hand, hand hygiene is really important. Everybody does the e-modules on hand hygiene if you work in a hospital. What are the percentages that people actually do it? Right, surprisingly low, considering that 99% of people actually had to do the module for their reappointment or their initial privileging. So it's not knowledge. We're talking about attitudinal, behavioral, performance kind of things. And that's hitting the, he the head and the heart, as I say. And so we have to think with different approaches, how to tackle this. We also need to push people into that zone of discomfort, but not unsafe or threatened, as I alluded to at the start of the, the presentation. And it's because what happens when you feel unsafe or threatened? Either you're gonna prepare for the fight, or you're flying, right? You're, you're getting out of there. And those are the two reactions that people will naturally have if we take this kind of an approach. 
Making people uncomfortable, though, is okay. It gets them thinking. Well, and if we think about it, the principle of going to the gym is all about making people uncomfortable, right? If you go there and you don't have that healthy burn in your muscles, did you do anything? If you, if you didn't break a sweat, did you? Did it actually happen? Does it matter? But we also don't want people to be unsafe in a gym and tear like a muscle or injure something or get muscle injury and require a hospital admission. I've seen it. It's happened. Boot camps are bad if you've never done it before. These are realities. Unsafe is not good. Threaten is not good. Discomfort, however, gets people thinking. And that's a huge step. Make people critically reflect and think, and you got to create the space for that. Supportive space for the dialogue. You can't just throw the question out there and say, good luck. You actually have to have an opportunity where you can facilitate the conversation, the dialogue. Ask some guiding questions that can allow the individual to go on a journey. And that's really important. That's a different type of research. What we find is also it's not good enough to have the questions and to help somebody realize change has to happen. But you have to give them the tools, the resources, the mentorship to actually move forward. Despite all of this, you're still gonna get resistance to change. Why? Because that's society, that's our community. There are always someone who has a polar opposite viewpoint to you. And this is particularly important for those who are doing research and scholarship in this space. And oftentimes, people like ourselves are not supported and are often the subject of threat, both verbal or social media or other, because of what we're trying to do. And so, you know, I, I tell my colleagues this all the time. If I was doing a clinical research question, looking at which drug was better, nobody's going to send me a death threat, right? Nobody's going not, to, nobody's going to troll me on, on social media. But because of the type of work that I do and my colleagues do, this is unsafe space for us. And so we collectively need to find ways to create supportive spaces for researchers and scholars that want to do and need to do this type of work because it's important work. We need to lean in. Our leadership in our centers and our organizations also need to find ways to support this type of research and work because it matters. My colleague, Dr. Lynn Ashdown, uh, told me this, and I, it really caught my, uh, you know, my my imagination. To be a disruptor, you need to be able to gently rock the boat sufficiently to make it uncomfortable for those in the boat, but not so much that the boat tips over. And for me, that's actually a, a good visual, right? You know, if you've ever been in a canoe or a, a boat and it's moving around a little too much, yeah, you get unsettled. You start looking at your circumstances. You start asking questions. And so it's important to be in that kind of space. Now, here are a couple other things that we need to think about. Relationship and trust building take time. This, you can't expect, oh, my grant is due next week. I'm just going to go and find somebody like a researcher and say, hey, can you sign that for me? I, I don't, I've never worked with you. I don't know you. You don't even know what I'm thinking, but uh, can you sign up for this grant with me? Can't do that. Same thing with communities, right? It takes time. Some of this research, and I was talking to a couple of colleagues at the conference this past week, it's taken years. Not one, not two, not five, some up to 10 years to build sufficient relationships and trust that they were permitted the opportunity to ask questions. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of coffee, a lot of tea, a lot of food, a lot of conversing, learning, listening. That has to happen, that's critical. You have to unpack the power, the privilege, the hierarchy, especially when we walk in, wherever you're coming from, it doesn't matter. You've got the air of uh, the ivory tower coming in, academia, and you have to unpack that. Voice. Who has it? Who doesn't? These are important. Developmental approach, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. 
is also important. It's a different strategy to looking at evaluating this kind of work, seeking feedback, making iterative changes, listening is critical. I'm going to pause there, see if there are any quick questions before I talk about creating this space. How do we do that? Just want to see if there's any questions or comments. We're okay there, Elif? Yep, all good, nothing in the chat. Okay. So I'll start off this next section by just putting this quote up there. And I heard this uh, quote by a colleague, Dr. Cynthia Whitehead, um, who uh, mentioned this at a, at a talk that she was giving. And it is really st stuck with me. The trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing becomes as political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. And I think for me, I was fortunate slash jolted when that kind of conversation and experience happened with me about six, seven years ago. And as a result, I've gone through that journey uh, and I've had to reconcile with myself. What do I do? How do I step into this kind of work? And fortunately, I had a formal role at, at, at one point in, in the Ottawa Hospital where I was the inaugural uh, Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and as well, Education. And I could actually bring those two portfolios together and try and help figure out a, a way forward. But then something changed, which then forced me to think about this question. I build it, will they come? How do I create community? And I, in order to understand this question, I'll have to give you a little bit of a background of the summer of 21. And for me, this was a, this was a tough summer professionally, and that's built over into my personal life because it's all just life, right? There's no such artificial separation of work and personal. Right? It's just life. And so that what was happening in my personal uh, professional life, the upheaval of being restructured and having a loss of identity and connection, sense of failure, all of that was really tough to try and wrestle with. But I was very fortunate. I had an opportunity to reset. Amazingly supportive community, really fronted by my wife and immediate family, uh, friends, clinical and education colleagues, but also my division leadership. That's important. Leadership matters, right? And they provided space for me to think. And I was trying to think, well, how do I take all this stuff that I've done right? Uh, this, these areas of expertise and experience that I've had, could I do something with it? Could I make something happen? And so calling a lot of friends, learning some new skills, I went from being underemployed to launching the Equity and Health Systems Lab in three weeks and created this space. And I, I think I was, once again, immensely grat immense gratitude for the people that wrapped around me in what could have been a very traumatic and very difficult time. It was, but I was able to see a path forward because of the people that were around. And so what is this, this space, this lab? Well, it was established, as I said, September 21. And it's a space where there's amazing people from diverse backgrounds, expertise, experiences, professions, geographic spaces coming together to create this unique community based on shared principles and an approach. So you're probably wondering, what's that approach? What, what's drawn all these people together? And this is the approach that I articulated and it's continuing to evolve, but essentially these are the key points. Humility, curiosity, listening, reflection, unlearning, relearning. And as you're continuing on this, the hope is that someone identifies you as an ally in that space that you will then find collaborative partners in this space. Now this really not only internally resonated with me because this is how I have always thought about this kind of work, but not just this work, but education and my clinical everything. But it really resonated with the people that wanted to be part of this and those that we were collaborating with. And what we've tried to do is make sure that it resonates within the work that we're doing in this lab. 
what we found that it was really important was culture. Culture was a critical factor in setting the right tone that was based on lifelong learning, challenging the status quo, bringing our expertise and experiences, creating that space for experimentation, but being scholarly. No such thing as work without scholarship. And trying to understand how do we make an impact with this? And how do we foster collaboration, both internally within the lab, but also with those that are, that are, that the approach really resonates with? How do we work and learn together? How do we amplify each other in this kind of space? And with that, one of the things that I really wanted to make sure was that we were gonna be known for creativity and innovation, right? And partly because we can go back to the same well all the time and expect different results, but oftentimes they're not because we're drawing from the same old, same old. One of the things we wanted to do was to be transdisciplinary to try and find people that were outside, not just the medical profession, not just health professions, but outside the health system, to draw them into the conversation, to understand the, their domains and where we could learn from them. And in doing so, what we found is that we're now over 90 members. We're over uh, across the world and we're expanding. We've got people as far away as Australia and South Africa that are engaging in this work. And uh, we've been able to identify not only work uh, that we're doing, but also that there's almost a social enterprise aspect to what we're doing as well, which is different. So it's not like most labs uh, that you would think about in this kind of space. It's, uh, it's a bit different. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to actually make the link between all these things, the questions out to impact and how do we, how do we engage right along the continuum of this journey? And what we found is that we're actually identifying this process as we do this work. And we're doing this within topical areas, which I'll show you in a second. Questions, dilemmas, we may have to actually identify the, the knowledge that needs to be drawn into the space. How do we translate that and mobilize that or use implementation sciences uh, methods uh, to make that happen? How do we evaluate for impact? What is impact when you're talking about this? Well, most likely it's not gonna be a pie graph or a, or a, a p-value uh, statement. It's probably gonna be stories. It's gonna be narrative. It's gonna be lives impacted, sense of belonging, different. But what we're also doing is tying this as well to policy and advocacy work. Right? And oftentimes when we do this kind of work, we're in one of these silos, right? We, you're, you may be a clinician and all you see are the dilemmas and the questions, but you're stuck there. Or you're, you're, you, you're diving into the theory, you're sitting there, or you're, you're taking somebody's work and implementing, but you're not actually pushing further. What we've done in, the, in, our, in this lab is to actually bring all this together to create this around nodes of activity that we're trying to do. That wrestle with advocacy, yes, wrestle with specific research and scholarship questions, uh, looking at, at the uh, inequities. Education strategies, we've been very much involved with, for example, the CanMeds project on in different levels with the expert working groups, looking at health promoting work and learning environments, creating new mentorship and sponsorship models that really fit within um, the work of equity and so, uh, accessibility and social justice, and even rethinking how we do leadership development. Because the old ways clearly haven't suited this type of work or this type of advocacy work. And so we're, we're working uh, as, a, as a larger team and drawing others in to wrestle with these type of questions. So how do we create those collaborative partnerships? You need to bring people together, people with different layers of expertise, as well as those from the intended audience. Build trust as we do so through connection, relationship, expressing and demonstrating authentic vulnerability to get to trust. And as we do so, as we dive into this, as we want to build more trust, taking projects that allow us to work together see how each other work with each other collegially 
uh, and learn and push each other and support each other, what we're finding is that it's further reinforcing the trust within this group. So once again, taking that approach, creating space for dialogue that is safe, secure, accountable, giving grace as we ask questions because we're honestly trying to push each other and understand and having amazing people around the table who speak up and challenge and push is what we want and what we have been able to enjoy. And finally, thinking about what are we actually going to do? How are we actually going to do something that is going to make something happen? Because what we do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. Action speaks louder than words. So the question is, as we do this, who are the people we're partnering with? Well, we've got a very interesting group of partners that we've been very fortunate to work with that are diverse in their backgrounds and, and the focus of work that they're doing. And that's actually led us to being part of what is now known as team primary care, where we were asked to actually take the lead on building the equity, diversity, inclusivity, and accessibility cross-cutting team. We wanted to do so in a way that was different. Sorry, I'm flashing through this because I wanted to get to these slides. Where we look at the key elements of what we've done within this cross-cutting team is different. Most people, most projects that I've seen have honed in on one of these elements. But drawing from my past experiences, as well as those that are in the lab, we realize that it's got to be something that looks a little different. And so this is what we've been building and, and are in the process of launching. We're going to be also looking at how do we support individuals as we do this work through the levels, the micro, the meso, and the macro. And how do they look at uh, this work in the form of transformation of the culture that they find themselves in in the health system? And as we do so, we, we are creating this unique opportunity to do some work that is meaningful and also looking at the evaluation opportunity for this work. And what we've been able to do is to actually develop uh, with partners in the uh, team primary care project, we're drawing from new types of uh, theory that I hadn't learned in my master's of education, looking at developmental evaluation as one example, a, a methodology that's really helpful for looking at messy, complex, social, developmental projects. And secondly, the eco-normalization model, which was published by Dina Hamza and Glenn Regeer uh, a few, uh, few year, years ago. And this model has been really helpful to help us realize that there's a complex system that we find ourselves in. And how do we actually do this work that is embedded within this, this theory but also so that we can think about sustainability and longevity of the work. Because Canada is a country that's known for its pilot projects. There's no shortage of them. Sustainability and longevity have been the, have been the Achilles heel, as it were, for these projects and initiatives. And so we're trying to proactively address that by finding ways to embed these concepts and ideas into the system that we find ourselves in. So if I wanted to leave you with a couple of take-home points, three. First would be fostering an organizational culture that favors creativity and community. I think that for me was a critical first step in doing this, setting up the vision, setting up the approach, finding people who this really resonated, and then creating psychological safety to continue difficult, challenging conversations. Second, collaborative research partnerships bring ideas and people together. We are indeed better together as we do this work. There's no way that I can sit in my little microcosm in Ottawa, in my little department or division, and expect that we have all the answers. No, I've got to go find those people who have been thinking differently and want to collaborate and share, and they exist. They are not unicorns. They exist. We can find them and we can, and many of them are very open to working. Why? Because they have been isolated in their own contexts and they're excited about the idea of working together with others. 
final point was that education alone is insufficient for cultural transformation. And oftentimes this is, you know, we're educators. We, you know, everything's, you know, I've got a hammer, everything's a nail all of a sudden. And the reality is the health system, the messiness of the social uh, issues that we're trying to wrestle with, especially when we're talking about inequity, is complex. So you have to use different approaches, different theories, different principles, and different methodologies. In doing so, you'll actually come to something that is much more robust and has a potential for sustainability and longevity. So I just wanted to thank uh, my colleagues uh, in the lab, as well as many other collaborators that I've been very fortunate to uh, journey with, not over just the last number of years, but especially the last two. I'm just gonna throw this back open and see if there are any questions at this time. Great, thank you, Jerry. Again, please feel free to write it, your question in the chat or just um, use the hand raising function to um, speak. And I see two a uh, couple comments issued by Heather and Lori. Um, if you wanna have a look, they're just saying inspiring story. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Heather. I, I think one of the things that we often don't talk about it often enough, and this really came to the floor uh, when I was at uh, the conference in Halifax. So we don't often talk about failures often enough. We don't create space where failures are explored and understood. And the question is, what do we do, right? And uh, Lori, thank you. Willing rebels, I love that. That's a nice nice way of finding, of, of labeling individuals there. Thank you. Um, I mean, when I first, you know, had a conversation with him, it was very, very eye-opening, certainly. So I'm sure you'd have the same experience. So thank you so much again, Jerry. And um, I wish everyone a great evening. Thank you very much, everyone.